Uh, thinking about the Negro Speaks of Rivers, Kimberly asks, do you have any suggestions for pairing recent texts and or music with the poem? It's a great question. And I suppose it depends upon what you're trying to, to do with the comparison. What thread are you trying to, to pull forward or what are you trying to contrast? Um, but if we think about um, some of the ways that that contemporary uh, hip hop artists, for example, develop elaborate personas that sometimes bear a relationship with lived reality, but just as often are much more fanciful uh, feats of the imagination. Um, I think that's a really neat place to start and that can highlight how Hughes creates a kind of persona that really transcends who he was at the moment that he wrote the poem and explodes outward into something much grander. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Childish Gambino, for one. I think you, you could take a look at a lot of his <laughs> autobiographical songs and think about how this very nerdy kid emerges into something much larger. So that's just one example. What great suggestions. Um, so now a question for Jim, and this is um, an interesting one. Uh, Kimberly, uh, I'm sorry, Mary Coleman wants to know the standard for using English names as opposed to an author's native name. Um, and, and Vaughn is an interesting example, of course, um, because of the construction of that Sikal Sa name. So can you address both for her in particular, and then also how you approach for other Native writers? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. It's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a little different for each writer. Uh, so some writers uh, like Lynn Riggs and Will Rogers uh, only go by that name. Uh, and as far as I know, did not have names uh, uh, in Cherokee. And if they did, they kept them private. Um, for Gertrude Bonin, um, Zikala Shah, uh, again, which um, I can't remember if I mentioned it or not, but it translates as Redbird in Lakota, uh, was her pen name, but she also didn't always use it. Um, and so uh, when, when I talk about Gertrude Bonin, I always tell my students that as we talk about it in class, we're gonna call her Zikala Shah. Like that's what we'll do because that's how she signed the particular text that we're reading. But I also tell them that if we, if we read um, some of her editorials uh, or some of her short stories or some of her poems and she's identified as Gertrude Bonin, it's okay for us to call her Gertrude Bonin because I just want to convey respect for the decisions that she made. For some reason, she wanted to be Gertrude Bonin at that moment and she wanted to be Zik Halasha at other moments. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, I think that's what, what what has happened with a lot of native writers is that uh, researchers, scholars have gone back um, and, and, you know, started to translate their names um, into indigenous languages, or they might find evidence that their families called them by a native name. Um, and if that has happened, um, I'll always tell my students that that's happened, right? I'll say something like, well, his parents called him um, like Charles Alexander Eastman, right? Ohayesa, which means the winner, right? I'll, I'll, I'll remind them, um, I'll remind them of that. But it's also, I'll just say, I'll just say one more thing. It, it, it's also something that, um, you know, I, I, I always try to draw students' attention to language revitalization efforts. And when we um, when I teach uh, Bonin or, or Eastman or Riggs, I'll find videos um, of language instructors speaking Dakota or Cherokee um, or one of, the, uh, one of the Pueblo languages so that they can hear it 
um, and they can hear what the writers, um, not all of the writers, but what many of the writers would have been hearing uh, when they were uh, children. Can I pick up on that last point real quick yep. and ask a question of Jim? Yeah, so I, I love teaching um, Zikla Shah um, in, in a variety of different contexts. Um, and one of the, the issues that continues to puzzle me is it has to do with the fact that she is recording her life story in English but recalling moments that she would have understood and processed in Dakota. Um, and I'm always looking for the textual traces of that, that exchange. How do you go about locating those or, or what are some of the more prominent ones? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really tricky because you know, she, she, went, she went through the, the boarding school um, assimilation uh, process. Uh, and then wrote about it when she was older. So she's trying uh, you know, to recall and put into words an experience that she had when she was eight, you know, when she was much older, um, and when she was making the transition from um, a monolingual Dakota speaker to um, a bilingual English speaker uh, and to a writer um, who writes uh, predominantly uh, in English. Um, and, you know, as far as, um, you know, identifying places in her writing um, that might have been uh, influenced by the structure of, of Dakota or might have been influenced um, by the fact that until she was, you know, eight or nine years old, she was a monolingual Dakota speaker. It's just really, it's just really difficult. What I try to do um, instead is convey a sense to the students of what uh, more broadly the Dakota world was like. So I'll give you one, one, one example of this when it comes to American Indian stories. Um, so I'll tell them about uh, the Tio Shpaye. So this is a, a, a Lakota and Dakota um, understanding of social organization that emphasizes kinship between everybody. So for example, when she's moving in those early vignettes in American Indian stories between her home and the home of neighbors, um, and she's, for example, standing at the door of the teepee instead of entering, and she's talking to the elderly um, Dakotas inside the teepee, her actions themselves have been shaped by a very specific Dakota way of understanding kinship. So it, that, that to me um, is something that uh, is manageable. Whereas, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, where uh, the Dakota language itself might be making appearances is just, it's just really tricky unless she's using the Dakota words, uh, which she does more in old Indian legends than she does in American Indian stories. I'm sorry, that's not a terribly satisfying uh, uh, answer. Um, I, I will say about Will Rogers though, and this is something I'll return to um, uh, later, uh, you know, Will Rogers uh, writes in, in, a, in, a, in a dialect, uh, you know, he invents this kind of folksy persona that is very clearly scholars have uh, uh, identified embedded in what some of them call red English vernacular, uh, which is this, this, this dialect used by a lot of writers in Indian Territory newspapers, um, you know, wh who have adopted um, some grammatical structures from, uh, from, for example, Muscogee Creek. Um, or from Cherokee or from Seminole. Um, and and it, it, it becomes a part of these kind of dialect letters um, in Indian territory newspapers. And that absolutely influenced Will Rogers too. So, so as weird as it sounds, that question is actually a little easier to answer when it comes to Will Rogers. Yeah, of course, um, Mel Brooks would tell you that it's all Yiddish anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one last question with a quick response, because I know we need to take a break. And this is to both of you. And it's a wonderful question from Robert Kohler. 
Um, he, and I'm, I'm flashing back here to things my students have said to me. Um, Robert says, I hear comments from my students every year about the seriousness of the text that we use in class. And one student asks why in everything we read, someone dies. Um, Robert, I had a, a high school student one time come in and literally throw farewell to arms at me because he said he was so mad at the, about the death at the end and he was tired of reading about people dying. Um, Riggs writes about the important tradition of dance and Rogers adds humor. When does American literature in general start to bring in these lighter perspectives or, or does it happen earlier in there, you know, just not in our anthologies? Not knee slapping humor, but hopeful, positive, even witty points. Um, can you give some examples of texts? So maybe right now with things being so dark in all of our lives, it's particularly, uh, I, I can really affirm that impulse. So do you, do you guys have favorites that you sometimes use just to lighten the, the tone a bit in our classrooms? Well, I find Washington Irving pretty funny, but maybe that's, um, not what he's looking for. Um, a lot of Emily Dickinson poetry yeah. is very yeah. clever and fun. Um, I mean, Mark Twain is yeah. as central as they come yeah. and he's hilarious. Yeah, good examples. Jim, what about you? Do you have yeah, a I was, it's funny, I was thinking of, of Mark Twain uh, also, um, since he's also um, uh, from, uh, from my part of the my part of the of the world, you know, I, I think I, I'm I'm going to answer this with a with a very narrow um, answer about humor when it comes to Native Americans. So um, at the beginning of every class um, where I'm teaching Native American literature, I will take a moment uh, to tell students uh, that. Native Americans conceive of themselves as very funny and that they object across the board uh, to the prevailing stereotypes of them as, um, you know, stoic and laconic. Uh, and I point them to a chapter in a book published in 1969 called Custer Died for Your Sins, in which Vine Deloria Jr. Uh, uh, devotes a chapter to what he calls Indian humor. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll just t ask my students to read it um, or I'll read from it. Um, and it's full, of course, of Custer and Columbus jokes. Um, and, uh, and, and then I'm very, very self-conscious of teaching uh, Native writers who are really funny, like Thomas King, who you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. He has some just fantastic short stories um, that are really politically insightful, and at the same time, they're really funny in a, in a very cathartic way, which I think we all do need, um, and our students uh, need it uh, as, as well. Um, so, in any case, um, I, I actually tend to agree um, uh, with the person who asked the question. American literature generally doesn't strike me, for the most part, as very funny most of the time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it, does, it does take some looking for it. Um, you know, Sherman Alexie's uh, short story, Dear John Wayne, is one of the funniest pieces of American literature ever written. It's absolutely hysterical. Uh, and um, I won't say any more about it, um, but it, it's, it's one that, that the rest of you could look at um, if you were looking at something uh, to make yourself and your students laugh. I see Marissa's back on, so I think we're, we're being called to break. <laughs> uh,